When the best of me is barely breathing When I'm not someone that I, I believe in Hold on to me When the, I miss the light the night is stolen When I'm slamming all the doors you've opened Hold on to me Hold on to me Hold on to me when it's too dark to see when I am sure I have reached the end Hold on to me when I forget I need you When I let go, hold me again When I don't feel like I am worth defending when I'm tired of all the my pretending Hold on to me When I start to break in desperation Underneath the weight of expectation Hold on to me Hold on to me, hold on to me when it's too dark to see you, when I am sure I have reached the end. Hold on to me when I forget I need you, when I let go, hold me again, I could rest here in your arms forever cause I know nobody loves me better hold on to me hold on to me You better hold the applause. You might be throwing tomatoes after I'm finished. Excellent job, young lady, singing. I, I love that song, and uh, it fits really well with what God has laid on my heart and what has already transpired this morning. Um, the part of that song says, hold on to me when it's too dark that I can't see you. Uh, we need that, don't we? We need a God that... Uh, when he is not uh, visible, we can have the assurance that he's still there. And I am so thankful that the God I serve, even though I don't see him physically, I don't hear him audibly, but I know that my God reigns and that God is still on the throne, even though uh, the week we've had across the United States, and we'll discuss that in just a little bit, but uh, God is still God. And I'm thankful to be here this morning, thankful to... Um, being asked by your pastor to fill in for him uh you know by now the rascal that he is and and uh he is uh he's a good guy and i appreciate him so much and praise the lord what he is doing through him uh, in your all's midst turn in your bibles this morning the book of nehemiah kim and i were laying in bed the other night and She'd been reading the Bible through here recently, and she named the books that she had left to read, and Ezra and Nehemiah, and I can't remember what all was left, and she says, which is your favorite of those uh, four or five I mentioned? I said, it has to be Nehemiah. I love the book of Nehemiah, and, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, God will speak through me tonight to some needs uh, that we're facing, not only as a nation, but individually as well, and... Uh, that we can hear the word of the Lord this morning. Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakali, 
And it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the twentieth year, as I was in Sushan, the palace, that Hananiah, one of the, my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who were left, in, who were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant who are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O, God, o Lord God of heaven, and great and all-sparing God, who keepeth covenant and mercy for them who love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear be now attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel. Thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept thy commandments, nor thy statutes, nor thine ordinances, which thou hast commanded to thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the, Lord, the word that thou hast Thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the peoples. But if ye return unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though they were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of heaven, yet I will gather them from there, and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let me now let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who delight to fear the name and prosper. I pray thee that thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was a king's cupbearer. Let's stop right there and go again to the Lord in order of prayer. Fathers, we humble our hearts before your throne of grace this morning. We ask as we heard this uh, song sung, hold on to us. Hold on to me, Lord. I, I am nothing without you. I have no word unless it comes from you. I have no unction unless your spirit fills me. So I pray, Holy Spirit, for your anointing here this morning. And I pray first, Lord, that you would remove the sin from my mind and my heart that I've allowed to enter in. And I pray, God, that you would cleanse me. Wash me thoroughly with thy son's blood. Lord, I pray that you would give your people attentive ears to hear what your spirit would have to say to them today. And I pray, God, that not only would we be hearers of the word, but we'd be doers, obeyers of your word. And let us obey what uh, you speak to us to this morning. I pray, Lord, that if uh, there's one who's gone astray, that you would draw them back to you. If there's one who is here without a Savior, that today you would remind them of your son's sacrifice on their behalf and they would make Jesus their Savior before it's everlasting too late. May you have your will and your way in Jesus' name. Amen. What a week we've had in the United States. Nineteen people were killed in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, the horrific news of most of those being children is just uh, unbelievable, isn't it? It, it? It's hard to understand how anyone, and we, we understand that uh, most of the killings like this are not done by sane people, are they? They're, they're done by someone who has mental illness. But you add that on to others, that, uh, shootings that have been in the past, and then who, who knows uh, the untold number of abortions that have went this week across the United States, and and, and it, it, when you think about it, it it's, it's a sad situation, isn't it? Death is at every hand, and you think of the innocence of those who have been killed. It, uh, it breaks their heart. We're celebrating Memorial Weekend this weekend, and, and, and we remember those who have died in, in battle to uh, give us this privilege that you and I are having right now, this, this joy of, uh, of not being... Uh, uh, 
forced by the government to, to go underground to worship. We can worship freely and openly here in this place, in this, this house called Oklahoma Baptist Church. And we're, we're grateful for those who, men and women who have served in the past and have given their life to uh, secure these freedoms for us. I was thinking earlier when I thought about those men and women who served, it was uh, the parents who, uh, when their son or their daughter was serving uh, in a foreign land that uh, they never wanted to see that green car pull into the driveway, did they? It, uh, it, it was a sad sight because that was the officers coming to tell them that their, their child had died in battle or they were missing. And I, I've seen it in movies and I've heard stories told about it. And it, 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 it's a sad thing, isn't it, when, when we hear of those instances? Well, how do you react when you receive bad news? How do you react when you hear something that uh, brings distress or brings, uh, uh, you know, just, just uh, uh, an attitude of what next? Nehemiah had that same thing happen to him as he was serving as a king's cupbearer in the king's court. And he had been led in uh, captivity with the uh, Jewish nation of Israel as they had uh, disobeyed God over and over and over and God's mercy had been poured out on them time and time again and yet they like us oftentimes choose not to repent and here they God sent Nebuchadnezzar to uh, destroy that uh, relationship and bring them into captivity and they served for 70 years but there was a remnant who was left, and God's always a God of remnant, and God always leaves a remnant of his people. And, and, and some of those guys came, and some of his brethren came to visit uh, Nehemiah, and they asked, he asked them, how are things back in Jerusalem? And uh, the story was not good. It was not well. It, uh, he was told of the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down, and there was no protection for the nation. How do you respond when you hear bad news? Yeah, Nehemiah was a man of action. Sometimes we hear bad news and we just, we just, sometimes we just get froze, don't we? Uh, when you when you heard about the shooting this week, it it it, it probably thought, well, it, it broke your heart, or it you just nonchalantly moved on or didn't think much about it, but. But, you know, sometimes things are going to happen in our own lives that we're going to have to deal with, uh, whether it be death or sickness or whatever. And sometimes when we hear bad news, we have, to, we have to do what Nehemiah did, and we have to become people of action. We just can't sit back and, and not uh, take action when something bad happens. Nehemiah, first of all, when he heard the bad news about the disarray in, in Jerusalem, he, he was no doubt a man of prayer. And I think the first thing that you and I need to make ourselves commit to is, is to prayer. Where do you go when, when you hear bad things? Where do you go when something uh, tragic happens in your life? Well, uh, it's easy to call a friend or it's easy to tell a church, but our, our number one uh, person we need to go to is God Almighty, isn't it? Uh, God hears. Uh, God sees. God knows. God already knows before eternity what was going to happen. See what happened this week in, in Texas. God already knew about it, didn't He? I, I can't imagine what those parents are going through. I can't imagine the, 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 the horror of, of having a child killed or even as a grandparent. I can't imagine my, my, my son or my, or, or, or grandson, my granddaughter or grandson uh, getting killed. But when, when you think about it, God already knew about it. God is eternal, isn't He? And when we take the time and make prayer a priority, see, God has no clock or calendar, does he? Time is past, present, future is all one to him. He, he, he sees the past and, and, and he knows the future. And, 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 and yet when we are controlled by the clock or calendar, we, we're, we're only here for a season. But God has seen this coming. And if you're facing something presently, if you face something in the near future and you, 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 you have a tendency to, 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 to uh, 
get frantic about it or to worry about it or fall to pieces about it. Just know that God already knows. God knew about, about your situation, about this situation, before time even began. And when we realize and understand that God is a, a, a God of eternity, we also know that God is a God of sovereignness, and, and it means He's a God of all authority and all power. And, and really, we shouldn't get upset or shook up about things because it'll happen the way God wills it to happen, doesn't it? I've learned to play, pray as, as a pastor when, when someone was sick or, 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 or in the hospital or what have you. I, I used to pray that God would heal them, and I still pray that God would heal them, but I pray God heal them according to your perfect will and glory because God's will is perfect, and sometimes it isn't God's will to heal them, is it? I think we spend a lot of time keeping people out of heaven praying for their wellness and that's not wrong to do but we need to pray that God your will be done but pray verse 5 he says verse 4 when it came to pass when I heard these things I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven it doesn't we don't know it says certain days it could have been 10 days it could have been 30 days it could have been 50. we don't know how long uh, Nehemiah prayed and fasted over the situation they'd heard about in Jerusalem but folks we we need to become a people of prayer do you know that prayer is the least used weapon we have in our arsenal against Satan anybody know how long the average Christian prayer is around a minute you long and we pastors aren't much better uh I think I read this statistic several years ago that pastors only pray about three to five minutes a day. Church, we've stopped praying, haven't we? Uh, and do you know that, that when you stop praying, you make yourself vulnerable to the uh, satanic influence and to the temptation of Satan? We don't have that shield of uh, faith before us. We don't have prayer uh, as our weapon, and, and Satan has rough shot over us. He can, just, he can just come in without. If we don't have the Word of God and prayer coupled together in our lives, then we are, we're, we're making ourselves vulnerable to the temptation of Satan, and it's, we become easy prey for him. Nehemiah was a man of prayer, and he understood that prayer was important, and he, he understood that the only way that, that, that God could uh, change the situation that was at hand was to him to begin to pray. Now, now, sometimes prayer doesn't necessarily change the mind of God, but it changes our minds, doesn't it? It changes our countenance. It changes us instead. I'm sure God already knew what he was going to do at Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, before Nehemiah started praying, but... Uh, Prayer is, it's a commitment that we need to make daily. And we don't need to do it just in times of emergency, do we? And I'm afraid that's what we've conditioned ourselves as Christians and as churches to do. We only pray when something affects us. And I've been guilty of that church, and it's not the way we need to do it. But not only did he pray... He paid, prayed specific prayers. You know, I, I'm guilty of praying. I, I lump all my sins into one thing and say, God, forgive me of my sin. And that necessarily is not true. And we wanna, we're going to talk about his repentance next. But we, we, he, when he began to pray, he began to ask specific prayers of God and began to intervene for the condition of the nation of Israel and, and, and their vulnerability without a wall around them. And he began to pray that God would, would intervene in that situation. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awe-inspiring God, who keepeth covenant mercy for them who love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house. So he asked God to be attentive to his prayer. But in his prayer, he had an element of repentance, didn't he? 
You know, I, I think repentance has become old-fashioned in the church today. I, I can remember growing up that uh, when, when the altar call was given, not only did lost people come to get saved, but, but saved people came to, to repent before God, and the, and, and, and the altar would be full of people confessing their sin before God. Somewhere down the line, we've made it uncouth to be repentant toward God, and we don't repent like we need to. You see, the time we need to repent is, is not... Uh, uh, Ten years later or five minutes later, in fact, the time we need to repent is if we're uh, where we need to be in fellowship with God. When the Holy Spirit, he, He'll be present in your life before you uh, are tempted to sin. When Satan has tempted you, he'll, he'll tell you not to take the bait of that temptation. But when you disobey the Lord of God and you don't listen to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be there. Or, or when you do take that sin and, or that temptation and turn it into sin... The Holy Spirit will be there immediately to tell you you've turned your back on God and you've sinned against the Lord God Almighty. And that is the moment you and I need to repent of our sin. Not wait till we have our prayers at night. Not wait till Sunday. Not wait till days down the road. We need to repent immediately. But the problem is, you and I, I don't know about you, I'll say my problem is, is that I don't repent immediately. And one sin leads to another sin, and sin becomes snowball effectual. And before long, I'm cold and indifferent toward God and toward my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm not living my life the way I need to be living it. And, and I find myself in a fleshly existence instead of a spiritual existence. Unrepentance has got, was where, what got the Israelites where they were in this situation anyway so when something comes into your life when 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 you have circumstances like we've had this week and uh, and it'll happen every week until we die or until Jesus comes back. That's going to be the norm, isn't it? Something's going to happen all the time. But we as God's people have the answer. We need to pray. We need to go to the God of heaven and ring those bells of heaven with prayer day in and day out. And I'll admit, I'm the, I'm the world's worst that I get too busy to pray. And I've heard it all my life. If I'm too busy to pray, then I'm busier than God wants me to be. I, I shouldn't be too busy to pray. I should make the time to pray. In fact, our spiritual lives demand it. But then we need to repent. He says, we've dealt very corruptly against thee. And this is where his repentance becomes uh, pinpointed to. Not have we dealt corruptly against thee and have not kept thy commandments, nor the statutes, nor the ordinances which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Sin in the heart of a believer immediately robs that person of joy that's the first to me that's the first fruit of the spirit that gets stolen from you and i we know that john 10 10 says that the devil comes not but to steal kill and destroy and the first thing he'll steal from you and i when we enter to a time of sinfulness is that our joy will be depleted Someone said years ago that you know, we, we as God's people should be the joyous people of all the world because of Jesus Christ, shouldn't we? I mean, when you really realize it, if you remember the day you got saved, I remember it was April of 1980 when I got saved, and uh, I went down a sinner with a burden of sin, but I, I, I rose back up with the joy of the Lord in my heart because the sin had been lifted from my shoulders and from my back, and I, it, it was a joyous day. But I remember, I can't remember who was preaching, but he, he said too many church members look like their mother-in-laws moved in with them. They have such a sour face. Uh, uh, just imagine that. <laughs> so those of you all who still have mother-in-laws. Uh, Satan robs us of our joy when we allow sin to enter into our lives. And no wonder there's... Uh, I, was taught, I saw a friend of ours, Kim and I, uh, grew up with in London uh, last night at Cracker Barrel, and he became a United Baptist pastor, and uh, and and we've known him ever since we were teenagers, and and uh, I think they even made came to Slate Hill a few times. I, I remember 
uh, talking with 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 the man, and but uh, he he was telling me about the little church he's preaching at, and 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 it's United Baptist. And he said, I told him the other day. He said, we've got the word United in our name, and he said, we're not United. Uh, I think that's a description of most churches today. Most churches aren't united. You know the reason that is? It's not God's fault. It's our fault. It's our fault because we're having unrepentant sin in our lives. We don't repent of sin like we should or like we used to. We don't. And when I don't let sin, uh, when, when I don't let the Holy Spirit forgive me of my sin and I hold that unrepentant sin in my heart, I become a miserable little man. And no wonder churches are fighting with one another. No wonder churches are splitting. No wonder uh, the children of Israel were in the shape they were. No wonder their walls were broken down. No wonder they found themselves in captivity because they never, they failed to repent. When Nehemiah began to pray, he knew his first item of business was to repent. There's no doubt that you and I both have things to repent of today. There's none of us perfect. I believe with all my heart there's a bunch of things our nation needs to repent of. Did you hear what Nehemiah did in verse 6 there? He says, confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned. He did corporate repentance, but he also did individual repentance. He says, both I and my father's house have sinned. He, he didn't whitewash anything, didn't he? He didn't. In fact, you know, sometimes we blame our, uh, others for our sin, and sometimes we even blame God for our sin. God, if they hadn't said that, I wouldn't have done this. Uh, it's not God's fault that we sin. It's our fault. It's our sinfulness, our selfishness. Folks, I believe God's calling us back as a nation to repent. I, God's calling us individually as Christians to repent, but I believe God's calling our nation to repent, and He's been calling us for several years now, and we still keep turning a, a blind eye to Him, a deaf ear. We, we, we've, we, we've seen uh, 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 the Y2K. We've seen uh, 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 9-11. We, we've seen COVID. We've seen uh, multiple uh, uh, school shootings, and yet we still have not repented. And we just keep going on like God doesn't see. Scary thing to know that I might hide my sin from you, but I don't hide it from God. I may even perchance hide it from my wife, but I don't hide it from God. God is omniscient. He knows all. And he sees all as well, doesn't he? God can look at the very depths of your heart and my heart and know what's there. He not only knows the sin I committed today, but he knows the sins I committed yesterday and 10 years ago, but he also knows the sins I'm going to commit tomorrow, doesn't he? amazing thing to me is that God continues to love me despite my sinfulness oftentimes I feel like the apostle Paul when he said he was a chief of sinners and yet even God used a sinner like the apostle Paul who would commit murder and done things you and I probably never will but God still loved him and used him after he repented of his sins So, church, God's calling us to pray. God's calling us to repent. But then, I think when we hear unsettling news, when we have problems that arise that causes us consternation and I think the third thing that Nehemiah did is he trusted in the Lord see as a king I spoke earlier that he was a man of action 
when he heard the bad news, he, he prayed, he repented, but then he, he began to formulate a plan. And no doubt it was a plan that God put in his heart. But he knew that he had to do something, so he, he began to formulate a plan of going back and helping his brothers in Jerusalem. And, but he knew he had an obstacle in front of him, being the king's cupbearer. He just couldn't come and go as he pleased. You see, you, you know what the king's cupbearer did? They tasted the food and the wine of the king before he ate it to see if he was poisoned. <laughs> Not a, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd sign up for that position. Uh, he would eat it or drink it before the king would so that... The, if he was poisoned, the, the, the cupbearer would die, not the king. So, if you understand kingship and things of that nature, here he is. He's got to be there whenever the king ate, whether it was three meals a day or whether it was snacks or whatever. He had to be there to taste it before the king. But then you, you weren't allowed to be in the king's presence with sorrow, you had to. You, King wanted it, people around him that was upbeat, happy. I, I think God does the same thing, don't you? He wants us to be upbeat and happy. But he knew that he had this obstacle, and he knew that unless the king released him of uh, of going back to Jerusalem, he couldn't go. But then, if he didn't have this hearing in front of the king, he could be beheaded for not being asked by the king to speak. If you read chapter 2, you'll understand that he trusted the Lord and the Lord provided for him. We sing an old song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Aren't those words so true? Trust and obey. It's not worry and fall to pieces. It's not worry and disobey it's trust and obey do you hear what the writer said when he wrote that song for there's no other way you can't be worryful and fretful and obedient at the same time because when you're worried and fretful you're disobedient aren't you so we need to trust and obey so nehemiah trusted the lord he prayed the lord and even when the king saw that he was uh, in, in a uh, worrisome attitude he asked him what and then nehemiah prayed again and king asked him more questions he gave him what he asked for and sent him back not only with the supplies but with a soldier escort to go back to jerusalem you know 900 miles from susa to jerusalem that's a big sacrifice wasn't it they didn't have, I don't know, how, how long does it take to drive 900 miles in a car today? It's a long time, doesn't it? Can you imagine riding a camel or walking it? See, obedience requires sacrifice. And sometimes you and I as God's children in this modern age of Christianity, we just aren't willing to give the sacrifice that's needed. So we don't pray, we don't repent. We don't trust the Lord. We just let life go as it may. And then most of the time when things fall apart, we blame God and say, why me, Lord? We've got to ask ourselves, why not me? So be reminded in this season of sorrow, in this season of bad news that we can take a lesson from Nehemiah. Pray, pray, pray. Make it. Yeah, I, we've got a lot of bad habits, but we need to, we need to condition ourselves to, to have a lot of good habits, and that's prayer, isn't it? Prayer and Bible study, not Bible reading. There's a difference between Bible reading and Bible study, isn't there? Let's condition ourselves to pray and then when bad things do happen we're we're practiced up you've heard the civil war story several years ago that a man in the army had went out at night and was coming back in and the, the night guard 
grabbed him and arrested him and brought him to the general and said, I found this man coming back. He was coming back from the enemy. He was went to tell them our next move and what our plans were. And the guy that was arrested said, no, sir. He said, that's not what it was. He said, I go out every night into the woods to pray. And he said, well, if that's the case, kneel down and pray. And the kneel, man knelt down and pray. And when he was finished, the general looked at him. I don't know exactly <coughs> how it went, but he said, you passed the test because a man who hasn't practiced in prayer wouldn't have prayed that good of prayer. I wonder, not if when it happens, but the next time bad things happen in your life will you have been practiced up in prayer or will it catch you by surprise as we prepare for a hymn of invitation I don't remember brother if you and your musicians will come this morning Maybe you're in your life you've fallen away from your fellowship with God. You're not where you need to be. <coughs> Thankfully, it doesn't affect our relationship. We're still children of God, but sin has a way of destroying our fellowship. It separates us from God, and you're not where you need to be. God's calling us all back this morning and he's calling us to be people of prayer and he's calling us to be people of repentance and to be people who trust in him. Why don't you come to the altar this morning? Maybe you're in the midst of bad news just like Nehemiah had heard the bad news about the people of Israel and their beloved city's walls being broken down. If you haven't read Nehemiah in a while, I'll, I'll, I'd go home and re reread it. it. It's an amazing story how God used Nehemiah to... Uh, he, he wasn't a preacher. Ezra was a preacher. He was a priest. Nehemiah was basically a construction worker that God used to build the walls of Jerusalem. In 52 days, about 2.5, 2.7 miles in a little over, nearly, not even two months, three months, he did a, a God-sized work. But be, come this morning, if God's spoke to your heart, if you're in the middle of a battle, come and give it to God. Whatever your need is. If you're here, you need a Savior. I know I didn't say much about Jesus Christ, but He is the all the one that makes it possible. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can pray and pray, but it won't be heard because you're not one of His children. Come and be saved this morning if God's calling you as we sing. <laughs>